All right, everybody, we're going to start. Yeah. All right. So the next session is about stormwater, and it's totally designed to confuse you, because if you're looking at your uh, written agenda, um, it's really different from that, but this is what we're doing. So we have uh, Reed Bogert from the San Mateo program first for the discharger perspective, and it just went up. There we go. And then we have Tom Mumley, not Jan, for the regulators, and Alicia for the science perspective. So I'll be introducing the first speaker. That's Reed Bogert. He's with the uh, Stormwater Program Specialist for the San Mateo Countywide Water Pollution Prevention Program, and he supports San Mateo agencies to comply with a municipal regional permit. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, so thank you for having me here today. I'm happy to represent the stormwater discharger perspective with relationship to the RMP. And uh, just one kind of note at the beginning of this presentation, uh, I'm about three years into my role with the countywide stormwater program. And I have uh, just a little bit of interaction with the RMP directly. So um, I'm going to do my best to kind of share some of the RMP perspective. But a lot of what I'll be talking about is focusing on what the stormwater programs in the MRP or the Municipal Regional Permit uh, Program area are doing. And uh, I was just thinking about this in terms of uh, action-oriented programs. Um, focusing on some of the, the approaches to controlling pollutants of concern in the Bay and tributaries to the Bay. Um, I consider us as the, the doobies, as in, uh, in the words of Dale Boyer uh, <laughs> shared, as, uh, as opposed to don't bees. Um, so we're, we're really action oriented and I'm going to share a, a bit of the perspective there. Um, so I will focus on collaboration with the RMP and then some of the things that the countywide programs are doing to address pollutants. See if we can get this scrolling. Okay, so just a little background. I'm not going to provide too much um, context here in terms of regulatory requirements. Tom's going to touch a little bit on that. Um, Alicia's going to really go into the details of the monitoring program. But just for a little bit of background on the uh, municipal regional permit for stormwater, these are the four major counties that are covered under the permit. Uh, plus three cities in Solano County, so that's the uh, Fairfield, Sassoon, and Vallejo. And then East Contra Costa has added a few um, municipalities recently as well. So just looking at some of the drivers for stormwater uh, management in the Bay Area with respect to the municipal permit, um, really Big one is pollutant control and looking at legacy pollutants, including PCBs and mercury. So those are uh, the top top dogs, really, in terms of pollutants. Um, and as many of you, or most of you probably know, um, the driver there is human health concerns. So um, concentrations of PCBs and mercury in sediments and how that could get up through the food chain and into sport fish that some folks are consuming. Has anyone tried? Uh, white sturgeon from the bay. I didn't know that we actually had white sturgeon. Have you tried? <laughs> James have tried it. Is this pretty good? I think I may have had a um, a, dr a dried uh, like a a jerky version as a kid, but um, interesting fish. Okay, some of the other drivers out there. That'd be closer to the computer, obviously. Um, we all know trash is a major issue with respect to stormwater. This is a highly impacted waterway. Um, one thing to note here is that trash is coming from many sources and, and also many pathways into receiving waters. And so stormwater is just one pathway among many. Um, you know, obviously things like homeless encampments are a huge uh, impact and um, also a uh, pathway that is linked to the stormwater pathway. So we're still trying to work out some of the issues there in terms of how stormwater is um, really the, uh, the focus there or being integrated or intersecting with other potential pathways. Uh, this is just a picture of runoff um, meant to depict mostly pesticides is what I'm thinking here. Pesticides and toxicity is another issue that is regulated, um, uh, regulates the, the permittees under the municipal regional permit. Um, there are plenty of pollutants out there that we are concerned about. 
uh, going back one, new and redevelopment regulations for properties of a certain threshold, obviously including uh, bioretention. That goes back about a decade or so now. So lots going on with bioretention and new and redevelopment projects. This is really, I was looking for a photo to convey hydro modification, which is another requirement for mostly large scale um, projects that are affecting maybe an acre or more and looking at stream impacts, erosion and flow. Uh, but of course you have associated flooding downstream in, in urban areas as well. Oops. Green infrastructure is a requirement under our permit. So cities are now, uh, had just actually um, submitted green infrastructure plans to the uh, regional board. And so we have requirements for meeting waste load reductions associated with green infrastructure projects. Oops, these are fast. <laughs> uh, nutrients is an issue that we're monitoring for primarily. This is uh, Chesapeake Bay, so not the Bay Area, but definitely something to, to continue looking at in the future. And then uh, next one here is the PFAS. This is a really common photo, right, of the uh, flame retardant that are used in uh, fire control and other many, many applications. So there are plenty of emerging contaminants that we're looking at now. There's a great stormwater uh, screening study that's underway that uh, the RMP is really focusing on. And of course, um, microplastics is new <laughs> to the scene um, with a lot that's going on. I think Alicia will probably touch on this too with recent studies in the Bay, but um, really looking at the impacts of stormwater and of course now tire wear is, is a major consideration. What do we do about that? Uh, quickly running through the major monitoring areas of the permit. We do a lot, so I'm going to talk mostly about stormwater pollutants of concern. Uh, there's a creek status portion of the permit that looks at biological and physical integrity of creeks. Uh, we have um, the stormwater pollutants of concern. I'm going to focus mostly on PCBs and mercury, as I mentioned, but there are others. And then the Bay Monitoring Program and um, the RMP here, we support directly through funding. The stormwater programs fund the RMP directly to do status and trends monitoring and also pilot and special studies. So just the lay of the land there. These are the key management questions that come out of those uh, uh, drivers. So uh, in terms of monitoring, we're looking at the sources and source areas where are the major problems uh, associated with pollutants of concern, Contribu contributions to bay impairment. So this is really looking at the intensity of um, loading from small tributaries to the bay and very sensitive areas in particular, looking at those. Uh, effects and then management act action effectiveness is another area of uh, monitoring and informing how effective current uh, management controls are, such as green infrastructure or trash control de devices like these large um, HDS units that are separating trash and sediment from water. Uh, and then pollutant loading and status. I, I would say the bulk of the monitoring work in recent uh, decades and more recently in the past five years or so has really been focusing on understanding um, what the current status is of those concentrations and loading. Um, and then future, looking more at trends. So how are things changing tempor temporarily and, and spatially um, over time? Okay, so I'm gonna talk about regional collaboration and uh, working with the stormwater programs. So uh, a couple, just a couple examples really. First one is reasonable assurance analyses for PCBs and mercury waste load uh, reductions, meeting the waste load allocations under the TMDLs for PCBs and mercury. So um, big effort currently, this has been going on for a few years now. Uh, all the programs under the permit have been developing models to basically refine, revise the baseline hydrology within countywide areas and then assess the uh, potential or future green infrastructure needed to uh, address those pollutants and get down to the waste load allocations for our region and to the countywide level or even jurisdiction level. And so this is just a chart here. It shows you the existing uh, project. So this is what's in the ground now. That's not modeled. Future and new uh, redevelopment is the projected growth of new and redevelopment projects that will have green infrastructure associated with them. Uh, regional projects are large-scale uh, underground retention devices that will 
operate at the watershed scale, collect a lot of stormwater, have potential for recharge, um, addressing pollution concerns as well, multi-benefit. And then uh, green infrastructure, uh, these are prioritized green infrastructure opportunities. We did some modeling in San Mateo uh, a couple of years back to look at priority areas for actually implementing green infrastructure and then other GI to basically get us to the finish line. But the main thing here is that you're seeing uh, load reduction uh, across time or across cost, you're getting less bang for your buck as you get up into these higher regions. So I want to focus on some of those lower uh, level items. As far as the modeling, this is a schematic of what the models tend to look like. This is the San, uh, San Mateo version. Santa Clara uh, County program is using a similar model. But basically, you have, um, oops, go back one. We have uh, a, hydro, a hydrology model using all of the data that's available, really um, pretty fine scale characterization of the watersheds, looking at all of these various uh, aspects. And then, we end up with an hourly simula simulation of runoff and sediment pollutant loading. Uh, so you can basically look at any storm from the past 20 years or so. You can look at theoretical storms um, and come up with runoff and pollutant loads. And then that is taken as an input to sustain is the model we're using to look at green infrastructure. So you take all of those loading and runoff results and then you run it through a green infrastructure model to come up with various scenarios for attaining those waste load allocations. So that's what we did. And this can be cost optimized. Uh, you can look at the most cost efficient way to implement distributed green infrastructure throughout a county or a jurisdiction or even within sub watersheds and look at uh, volumes captured or pollutants reduced. There are various me metrics that you can pull out of that. So the RMP has done a really uh, big thing for this. The, the main way in which the RMP has helped is through the development of the watershed spreadsheet model, regional watershed spreadsheet model, which looks at, uh, it's a pretty simple model, looks at regional pollutant loading. And this was used, uh, created using data from many years back, looking at associated concentrations with uh, land uses. So you can see these various land uses here, and then we have stormwater concentrations for PCBs and mercury. Really, um, these are from well-sampled watersheds. They are mixed land use areas. So they, uh, these concentrations are pretty well, you know, they're defensible. And these have been an, an invaluable input into the models. So uh, this is where things get interesting in terms of uh, modeling. I won't go into much detail here, but basically just want to say, uh, this is the, storm, the, uh, the San Mateo approach to our model where we took the refined, uh, we took our hydrology model and um, used uh, sediment data from Guadalupe watershed and a couple watersheds in San Mateo where we had some data. And then we came up with a sediment model, which is the one on the left here. Uh, and then using the event mean concentrations, those average concentrations for PCBs and mercury from the regional watershed spreadsheet model, we were able to uh, correlate those with uh, sediment loading and came up with uh, a water quality um, loading prediction for San Mateo County. So um, it was really a useful tool there for getting estimated baseline loading for these, these pollutants and then moving forward with green infrastructure planning. All right, um, I think I might have one. Oops. Another area that we have collaborated significantly with the RMP is on characterization of our watersheds. So, um, the RMP has done a lot of data collection, and as I mentioned, for those PCBs and mercury concentrations, collecting samples from the same watersheds over a period of two to eight years in some cases, um, getting really well sampled um, uh, results, but also doing some end of watershed sampling in collaboration with the stormwater programs, uh, collecting composite stormwater or sediment samples at the base of a watershed and understanding which ones are uh, contributing to loading, uh, which ones are more of a concern than others. So that's helped in a prioritization process for the countywide program to go in and say, okay, so we have some higher concentrations coming out of the watershed here. Let's go upstream of that, look in these uh, sub-watershed areas and identify potential source properties. So th these would be 
old industrial areas that have uh, pollutants coming directly off of the properties, sometimes from um, decades past when there were industrial uses there, um, and still have an issue of, of stormwater loading. And so we are uh, contributing to that and working together. I did want to mention that uh, this kind of gets into the cost implications for the municipality. So obviously we want to take the most cost effective approach to handling these pollutants. Um, this, was, this came out of the Clean Watersheds for Clean Day project. Um, I just want to highlight this number right here. So this is source property identification and referral. So um, looking at that compared to some of the other control options for municipalities, you have bioretention, um, catch basin, media filter, clean outs, uh, pump station clean out, uh, you know, various options here, the HDS trash units. But look at the numbers here. It's, uh, you know, you have three orders of magnitude between bioretention and a source property referral in terms of cost effectiveness for pollutant removal. So that's really where a lot of the focus is in terms of monitoring and, and action. We've been successful with, uh, with many or several source property referrals already the past couple of years. And then just taking a step back from a compliance regulatory perspective, this is a chart of uh, load reductions predicted out to 2020. So we had a 2018 load reduction requirement for the Bay Area permittees, and that was right at 500 grams per year. And we met that goal, woohoo, thank goodness. Um, but if you look at the colors here, we have, um, you know, the yellow is full trash capture devices, green is green infrastructure appropriately. Um, and then this blue little section here is source property identification and referral. So Getting us over that compliance benchmark there was source properties. We could not have done that with green infrastructure and the other controls alone. This big chunk right here is two kilograms of credit per year. Um, that's associated with a new program that was just recently developed by the permittees and implemented in July. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. And then this is getting to the 2020 benchmark, uh, three kilograms per year for PCBs. And we still have a gap. So even with implementing this big program, we're getting a lot of credit there. Um, there's still a chunk missing. We don't know if new and redevelopment is going to continue at the same rate uh, for implementing green infrastructure. Uh, doing public projects is going to be tricky to meet that, but um, that's what we're working towards. Okay. So just to touch briefly on two areas that the stormwater programs have really been focusing on recently. This is a little bit outside of the RMP, uh, but I do want to just highlight these two things that you know what we've been up to. Okay, so the first is the PCBs and building demolition program. So uh, there's a concern about PCBs getting into the MS4 system through demolition projects, and that would be done, you know, you envision a big, uh, um, demolition project happening, wrecking ball shows up, smashes the building, and the dust is getting everywhere, right? That's, that's the issue. Um, and, and some building materials dating back from the 1950s to about 1979 or 1980, um, caulk in particular, maybe some paints, um, adhesives have PCBs in them from that period. And so, uh, we have target, we've created a, a protocol for sampling for those materials and have targeted them for um, screening in building demolition projects to help account for, um, account for those pro uh, properly because the EPA um, and the Water Board, uh, you know, they would be, like to be able to do that where they wouldn't otherwise be uh, screened for or accounted for. And so um, the Bay Area municipalities have done that. Uh, we've implemented programs by um, July 1st. And um, this is a, a significant, I think, water quality control program, but also helping uh, leverage resources. And it's kind of a newer uh, approach to compliance in terms of meeting um, water quality regulations through a control program. So we've been successful with that. And then the other one I want to um, mention here is green infrastructure planning. So as, as I said, green inf infrastructure plans were just submitted to the water board recently. Um, and this is going to be a focus for the municipalities moving forward to achieve um, waste load reductions, but also to get some of those multiple benefits that we've heard, heard about already, um, as Eileen mentioned this morning. And so I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this. And there's actually a, a neat um, 
uh, presentation coming up at the State of the Estuary Institute or State of the Estuary Conference uh, on October 22nd, where you get more detail on some of this work. But I did want to cover kind of what we talk about with green infrastructure in terms of stormwater. Um, so it's definitely, you know, treating stormwater within the right of way or on parcels. Uh, it's, we're not talking about wetlands or other forms of green infrastructure in, in parks, which may be beneficial as well. But really focusing on these three scales here. So we have parcel scale, green streets at the street scale, and then regional projects. Um, so at the parcel scale, um, we, this is mostly, it could be uh, publicly funded projects, but mostly private projects, new and redevelopment, um, and it's managing on-site. So pretty straightforward. That's our modeling has shown that most of the um, uh, the green infrastructure uh, uh, implementation will occur at, within the new and redevelopment projects. Green streets are operating at the street scale. Let's see if we can get this guy. Okay, um, and these uh, these could be locally funded, but there are opportunities to do state uh, grant programs. Uh, maybe a large corridor project that has multiple bioretention units, uh, looking at integrating with safe routes to school or other transportation-related infrastructure. So there's state funding that could help uh, support those projects. But that's really the focus for municipalities in the green infrastructure plans. Oh, and then uh, the regional scale retention projects. So these are large devices that would go underneath a ball field or uh, a park, and um, you would basically collect water from all around um, neighboring drainage areas. It could be hundreds or thousands of acres that are contributing to a subsurface system. And uh, these could be funded various means, grants. Um, Caltrans has funded two projects in San Mateo County uh, to advance design and, and construction. So, um, and there are implications for multiple jurisdictions working together on those projects um, or even regionally across the Bay Area to support that kind of approach. So I'll just leave you with these uh, kind of next steps. So we'll continue green infrastructure planning. Uh, we have the PCBs and mercury control programs and uh, data collection focusing on trends and emerging contaminants. Um, so that's kind of the, the future for stormwater in the next few years. So I'll leave you guys with that. Next one. Thanks, Reed. And next we have Dr. Tom Lumley, who's the Assistant Executive Officer of the San Francisco Bay Water Board. Um, he's worked there for 36 years, and he's also the Chair of the RMP Steering Committee since 2011. Thanks, everybody. This is a kind of, it was an opportunity to, a challenge that became an opportunity because we wanted to have Jan O'Hara, who's a key member of our staff, to give his presentation, but she had overlooked a personal commitment to be back east and somebody had to pitch hit and I said, I will. Mm -hmm. I got a few things to say about stormwater and <laughs> but but I'm gonna focus today though was how the RMP has informed board's actions related to stormwater. So I'm gonna give you some history since I was there at day one and then show you some examples of how this has worked through the years. So let's start with oops, look at it. How oh, this sensitive. Okay, it, was, it did start in 1993. It started in 1986. In 1986, our board amended the basin plan. And then that key, key part of that basin plan with new water quality objectives for toxic pollutants, primarily the heavy metals, the copper, nickel, zinc. And in doing so, in public comment, the issue came up. So you're establishing water quality objectives for these pollutants of concern at that time in the Bay, and we have no idea whether they're, they're being met or could be met, and because we, we had essentially no data, and at the same time, there was potentially significant regulatory challenges that the POTW community was going to face. And, uh, and so, big concern there. And in the same time, as you, as you know about the Bay by that time was fairly urbanized, and even the wastewater community says, if we've already spent a lot of public resources, as Eileen said, before we spend more public resources on wastewater sources, shouldn't we know about the urban runoff side of things? Good idea. So let me just move us to the next part. Two major ideas came out of that 1986 basin plan. One was we need an urban runoff management program. So there's actually language in the 1986 
phase of plan that challenged the Santa Clara Valley and then the Alameda County municipalities to begin uh, monitoring and development of plans to manage urban runoff. So that's when that started. At the same time, the idea of an RMP was born because back where, where the board was challenged with establishing water quality objectives, not knowing whether it could be better or not. So it made, so the idea, shouldn't we develop data on the bay, i.e. an RMP? So let's put the RMP into context between the late 80s and early 90s, we cobbled together some contract money and did a series of pilot studies to start measuring metals and then hydrocarbons in the bay. So those pilot projects occurred over the like three plus year period and ultimately came to, came to fruition in 1993 when we did formally establish the regional monitoring program, which included participation by the, by the municipal Wastewater community, the industrial wastewater community, the, now you can put this into context, the municipal stormwater community, the dredging community, and others. But keep on, 1993, we started the regional monitoring program. In 1999, the regional monitoring program established the sources, pathways, and loadings work group. Should be loadings work group. 1999, remember that. And then subsequently in 2009, we, we established the small tributaries loading strategy. 93, 99, 2009. Let's look at what the, put the history of the permits. The first permit issued by our board was in 1990 to the municipalities in the Santa Clara Valley. It was actually one of the first in the country, and I'll argue is the first meaningful stormwater permit issued, municipal stormwater permit issued in, in the country. The others were mostly a facade, frankly. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and to put some historical context, I, well, well, I think I'll, I think I'll move ahead. Subsequently, 1991, Alameda County was permitted, then 93, San Mateo, 93, Contra Costa, Fairfield is a student city and one permit in 1995 and subsequently 1998. So put that in the context, RMP uh, born in 1993, Sources, Pathways and Loadings Work Group 1999 is overlaps with this history. Oh, and by the way, you see, I, I take personal responsibility for those outlines <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not claiming that they are accurate. <laughs> so, no, but in this time frame here, think about it. We are asking these newly permitted entities, very, really just in the infant, you know, your infant development stage of their life to contribute to the regional module program. And they were kind of stunned. You mean, we're barely getting our act together. And you're saying we have to contribute to this Bay monitoring program. And we had to, Keep saying, like I was propping up Mike Carlin, who was having to deal with a lot of this at the time. So trust us, it will pay off in the long run. You know, but you have to be party to this. And that's why by, so during those early days, it was a tough, somewhat of a tough sell, but we required it or, and they, they behaved accordingly as good children do. And about 1999, as we formed the Sources, Pathways, and Work Group is a big attribute of of that contribution that we need to understand stormwater better and we are going to commit some uh, resources from the RMP to do that. So that, that investment by the municipalities was going to pay off. A quick point in history, the 1990 permit we issued to Santa Clara County municipalities had a requirement to, a, to do a source identification. And it's through that effort that they, this sort of potentially a back of the envelope calculation because there was, we knew that there was copper in brake pads and this did, did a guesstimate based on uh, you know, wear of, of brake pads, the vehicle miles traveled and identified that co copper brake pads is a substantial source of copper to the South Bay. And jumping ahead a bit in time, the municipalities brought, brought together the, uh, the, you know, the brake pad industry, the automobile industry, the friction material industry to try to get them to work together, ultimately forming the brake pad partnership. Some of the fuel that helped make that happen, why would they come to work with us? They're saying, what's the problem? And the fact that we had the ability to show that levels of copper in the bay at that, at the early days exceeded what would be the federal water quality criteria, which we would either have to establish as the bay water quality objective, or we have to develop protective site specific water quality objects for coppers. But having that data indicating that there are challenges or consequences of copper in the bay helped make that partnership happen. So 
Moving ahead, we, we reissued all these permits over time, as you could just say, I guess give you a second to reflect on the, the numbers of times we've had to have permitting actions. And part of the emphasis I'm going to show here is because of all those permitting actions being a, a, a heavy lift each time, after we had completed oh, essentially going through as far as, uh, I think, when was that? Uh, Alameda for the set for the third time and before we started thinking about doing Contra Costa and San Mateo uh, reissuing their permits in the in the late 90s we said let's or let's think about doing this one time since these permits were all variations on the same theme each time the permit was issued we we're taking up new issues that begot the concept of a regional permit so in 19 2009, it took a while to develop. Our board has adopted what we call the Municipal Regional Permit 1.0, which one permit covered all the municipalities. And it subsequently reissued in 2015, which is the permit we're currently, currently operator. And we're already started the process of, of uh, developing what will be in the next permit. So putting that sort of into context, bear in mind now that uh, 2009, was when we for, we formed the uh, the tributary loading strategy. Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is, of course, is our our programs had matured a bit at that point. We knew we knew more than just about that. There was a lot of loading coming from from the tributary, small tributaries, including all the storm drain systems. But we need to know more about that, particularly in the context of the emergence of TMDLs. And the first one that was relevant was the Mercury TMDL which was ultimately approved, became formally approved in 2008. And just in a nutshell, the, the municipalities collectively were given wasted allocation of 82 kilograms per year. And at that time, we had an estimate of 160 kilograms per year. So practically, it was actually a 50% reduction would be the ultimate mandate. Fortunately, Due to better data generated by the regional monitoring program, we were able to uh, generate a, a more better estimate of loading, more like 115, which is, poof, we just eliminated 25% of the loading. Well, this is all, but that, that's fun, but it's not funny because it's all about get the facts right. Uh, let's, you know, let's make sure we get it right. But we, we're pretty confident. You know, there is, there is unfortunately mercury in runoff. Uh, you know, the dominant source of mercury in runoff is atmospheric deposition, coal burning in Asia. It's probably a three quarters of that load. But, um, next came, oops, PCBs. PCBs with TMDL was, uh, was approved in 2010 out of a total, a total annual maximum load of 10, we allocated two to the municipalities to, because they were the dominant source. And the 2003 load estimate was approximately 20 kilograms per year. So that translates to 90% reduction, a huge, huge challenge. And that's the challenge we're still faced with. However, we're trying to be informed about what are the right things to do, how to, how to manage this. And so coincidence with this all coming together, we talked about the small tributaries loading strategy emerging for the RP in about 2009. And th these are the four drivers in there. So sort of upper middle was we want to quantify annual loads and then how they're changing. But we not only do we want to know the total loads, but we want to know are there particular drainage areas that contribute uh, you know, a higher percentage, so if there's higher leverage drainages where we would presumably get the most bang for the buck, both in terms of effective load reduction as well as benefit. The bottom bullet or drop is about where where does the bay most care about it? Because we did the TMDL on, on a bay scale, and you know, are there parts of the bay more susceptible and vulnerable to to be speeds? And that's kind of what this last part is about. Coincident with that, we have formed the PCB strategy to get get our act together in terms of focusing attention on PCB load reductions and how the bay will respond. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the RMP work in that territory. So we started by saying we know uh, that there are areas around the bay where there's elevated PCBs in the margins. So this was an outgrowth of some early work. So we decided to, let's start with the three of the most of those that are being attended to. They happen to coincide with areas where the municipalities were doing those pilot studies that Reid referred to. So there was sort of a relationship where 
We know those actually were watersheds that have a lot of PCBs in them. And we also were concerned about, well, we know there's PCBs in them, they are margin sediments. So focusing in on one of them, San Leandro Bay, which, uh, we've done pilot studies at each of those areas and we're developing kind of data on like, how, is, how are those areas responding currently to external loadings? What's the predicted recovery? Will changing loads make a difference? So San Leandro Bay illustrated here, if you don't know it, it's, it's where the Air, Oakland Airport is. You go by it, it's Oakland Coliseum is right in that area. And it's, it's essentially a mini version of the bay, of the urban area of the bay, if you will, because of its, how it's enclosed. And, uh, and we also assume initially if it's fraud slowly to reductions, and I'll explain that in a second, but uh, we also know that there was highly contaminated, a lot of PCB contamination in the lower watershed, old industrial. There's actually was a GE PCB plant in that watershed. That's actually uh, being cleaned up uh, by, as a hazardous waste, waste generating facility. This slide shows you, illustrate what we know about PCBs in the Bay. We had done the survey in, in 2000, we, the RMP, and then following up part of this study in 2016. In those 16 years, the difference between blue and red, there's not a whole lot of difference. That's why we said it, the, the bay itself seemed to be, looks like it's slowly recovering, very slowly, not recovering. And, but we also note that there is a lot of, particularly a lot coming in from a couple of the inputs. Uh, uh, this is East Channel and where, this one? No, this one here, I guess, is, uh, is Elmhurst Channel, Elmhurst Creek. So, because both of those channels drain these old industrial areas. So what the recent studies point out that, yeah, it's, it's complicated in the bay as a whole, but in the areas in the vicinity of those inlets, we're finding that a lot of the contaminated sediment drops out, at least initially drops out there. So we could see the area in red is what drops out in, within six minutes, and the area in yellow is what drops out within an hour. And and actually the physics, we, we've developed conceptual models, understanding of how the system might respond. And it, it does say that the most contaminated particles are settling in these areas. So as the implication is, it might, will it make a difference then if we control loadings to those, to this bay? The, it, these results indicate yes. So put it in the context, we've done a, we've used our simple one box model of PCB loadings where we're look, be careful about the numbers here and good that they're small because I don't want to, it's not the numbers that count, it's the concept that counts here, is that uh, on the side here is mass of PCBs in the sediment in those areas, and this is time. And then the yellow line in the middle here would be current loading, and we're predicting how those margins would uh, behave uh, with concurrent loading. And you can see there is reduction over time, but if we, the, if we like have the loading, it, we get substantially, you know, we get this one, we, we reduce the loading completely here. If the loading increased, we'd have less recovery. But the two things we notice here is within 10 years, we can see that there could be a change with load reduction, but we also see that it flattens out because that just means that uh, just some load reduction may not be enough. But this is, these are the beginnings of, uh, of further consideration of how we're going to inform those management actions. So I'm just going to end with just the future now is, is about, what about the emerging contaminants? And we have embarked on a three year study of emerging contaminants and urban runoff. Alicia is going to give you a little more detail here. I'll just give you a broad overview. The main contaminants we're look, looking at are the PFASs, the poly and perfluoroalkyl alkyl substances. We actually know a fair amount about these in the bay. There are a lot of them in the bay. Not only the two primary ones that were mostly being used, PFOS with the O and PFOA, OA which are those particular chemicals are being withdrawn, but there are 3,000 of these compounds. So, uh, so we're looking at all of them and we're looking at them in the bay, in wastewater, in runoff. The phoxylated surfactants, that's a loaded term for surfactants, which is part of detergents, clean, you know, cleaning agents, uh, reason to be concerned. Phosphate flame retardants are a primary alternative to the PBDEs, the polybrominated diphenyl esters that turns. We want to understand, are we creating you know, the whack-a-mole problem as we see with pesticides and the like. And one of the last issues of concern is that we did non-targeted. That means we kind of, well, I don't want to explain that, but non-targeted means we kind of figure out 
what's in this soup when you, when you do these chromatographs. But we identified one one in particular was diphenyl, diphenyl guanidine, and it's a, a compound in tires. And uh, we found it particularly in San Leandro Bay, which uh, it's a rubber vulcanization compound. Uh, you know, we again highly abundant in the San, San Leandro Bay part of the study. It's slightly bio, biocumulative, but aquatic toxicity concern. So there's emerging concern also about microparticles, microplastics, recent findings, as substantial numbers of them are associated with, there's tire, not, not surprising, tire debris. Is, are the tire, is the tire debris itself a problem? That's a big question, but is what's in them is certainly of concern in compounds like this. So it comes with a lot of tire particles, comes a lot of this stuff. So just finished with this thought, I kept at this time of the year, it's hardly strictly bluegrass, and, and music is like the fuel or the nectar that brings that, that community together. If you go there, it's a very harmonious, very you know, wonderful atmosphere. Well, I like to think of the R&P is uh, it's not strictly bay monitoring, because we do study the drainages, but the R&P data are, is, are the nectar, the fuel of informing this great collaboration that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And next we have Alicia Gilbreth from the SFEI, um, from SFEI, and she loves being outside in big storms. <laughs> Okay, uh, we've been busy in the stormwater program. Can everybody hear me? Song? Can you guys hear me? Yes? Okay, great. So I'm gonna get right to it. Uh, we're gonna go over today uh, an older study that we've been doing for a few years now, and then we're also gonna hit up some new work that is either just coming online or we've been, or, um, whoa, or we're just finishing up with. So we'll start with our, our, older, our older study, the reconnaissance monitoring work. So recon monitoring for us is basically going out and trying to sample as many sites as possible, but during just one storm event. So we're really trying to characterize a lot of sites, but at a characterization level only. So we're trying to um, identify, as I think Reed mentioned, we're trying to identify sites, or maybe Tom, uh, where we might want to go up further into the watershed and do some investigations and possibly find some source property areas. Um, or, if, or if we're getting such low concentrations, we can kind of black it out and we're not that worried about those areas. Um, we've been doing this since water year 2015, so fall of 2014, and we've gone to about 75 sites so far. Um, I've been told this is a terrible picture, but I want to explain it. So that, that blue thing there is a person in the creek. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, it's nighttime, which is very common for stormwater monitoring. Uh, rain is coming in sideways, which is typical. And uh, this person in there, uh, I happen to know her. She's wet, and she's probably rethinking her career choices at this point. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We love what we do. Um, moving on. Uh, we just recently got a uh Supplemental environmental project funds to do suspended sediment loads monitoring. Um, the USGS and some other smaller entities have been doing suspended sediment monitoring around the Bay Area for decades. This is uh, all of the existing suspended sediment gauges, but there hasn't been a lot of work in San Mateo or Marin counties. So, with stakeholder input, we were able to select four new sites for monitoring in those counties. We are, um, this is a two year study, so we're just getting uh, stuff in the ground right now. Um, this is uh, Dr. Don Yi, aka MacGyver, um, installing uh, some equipment at one of our sites. So we're really looking forward to this study that's coming on this year. Uh, Tom mentioned the contaminants of emerging concern work. Um, we started a three year study last year. We got out to nine locations around the bay um, in our first year. The two blue sites are ones where we just sampled for emerging contaminants, but the red and the green, you can see that we are piggybacking on other studies. So we're, we're really coordinating a lot of our stormwater monitoring projects right now, which is uh, highly efficient um, from a monetary standpoint, um, also from a 
from a labor standpoint. Um, we are looking at, as Tom mentioned, PFAS, uh, phosphate flame retardants, it's oxalated surfactants, and what we call our stormwater CEC suite. We don't have a lot of data back yet, but we do have the stormwater CECs data. Um, and there's a few things. So this suite is um, has been created by a guy named Ed Kolodzie up at the University of Washington. And of course, uh, Becky Sutton is our lead scientist at, in the RMP for doing this work. There's a few things I want to mention. Obviously, I don't have a legend. There's too many uh, contaminants to, to list here. But first of all, I want to point out the concentration units are in nanograms per liter. So we're really talking about appreciable uh, appreciable levels of these pollutants. Um, also, this is our lab QA. So that's always, always relieving. Um, these are our two reference sites. So again, uh, uh, these are less urban areas. And so um, this is fitting with our conceptual model that a lot of these pollutants are are um, coming off of the urban areas. And Tom mentioned uh, tires as being a bad actor that we're, we're really thinking about right now, and this will come up in, a little later in my talk. Um, this is diphenylguanidine, which Tom pointed out. So those orange bars are appreciable in all, excuse me? It's everywhere, it's everywhere. yes, it's everywhere. Um, also, uh, Benzothiazole, which is a rubber vulcanization accelerator, um, and then hexamethoxymethylmelamine, or HMMM, which Becky likes to call, hmm, <laughs> um, also a tire ingredient. So we're definitely seeing a lot of tire ingredients in our uh, stormwater CECs. And this is a really big study. It's a three-year study. You can be sure that we will be presenting on this in the, in the years to come. Moving on to microplastics. So we just finished up a three year, uh, a three year study on microplastics in the Bay. Um, for a little context, we, uh, the RMP funded a pilot level study on this back in 2015 to look at microplastics in base surface waters and wastewater. And a couple interesting findings from that. Um, one is that the levels of microplastics that we found in the San Francisco Bay were greater than other North American water bodies. So this was alarming. And then also what they found in wastewater was predominantly fibers, but what they found in base surface waters was more dominantly fragments. So there was a disconnect and there was this hypothesis that was born that, hey, there's another, another big pollution pathway possibly that's bringing in microplastics and microparticles into the bay. So that led to a much more comprehensive study, this three-year study that, I've, that, that I'm going to talk about now. Um, where uh, it was about a million dollar study that was funded primarily by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And we got to look at uh, microplastics in wastewater, stormwater, bay surface water, fish and sediment. And then we also got to develop a simple transport model. So we're gonna talk about the stormwater component. Um, first though, I wanna give a little primer on terminology. So uh, when we ship samples off to the lab, um, they sort them all out, um, and then they characterize them in terms of shape or morphology, size, and color. Um, and this is a an in really enormous process all on its own. But at this point, all we can say is that they are microparticles. We don't know the underlying composition until we do spectroscopy. Um, and then in, in the case of our labs, they used FTIR or Raman spectroscopy. And at that point, they know the underlying composition and they can say something is microplastic. In the case of stormwater, about two thirds of all the particles were actually plastic. So I'll try to be really clear about when I'm talking about particles versus plastics. I, I will say that only a small subset, um, five to 10%, are actually analyzed using spectroscopy because it's a much more um, intensive process. So we got to sample 12 locations around the bay and uh, we sampled during, we piggybacked on that reconnaissance monitoring work. We got to do, uh, um, we got to look at these microparticles in one storm event each and, um, and we composited over the course of the whole storm event. What we found is that half of the particles in stormwater were these rubber-like fragments. 
and we can our our spectroscopy instruments were having a really difficult time identifying um, that these were tire related, but we sent off a subset to um, to a NOAA laboratory where they use a different form of spectroscopy, something called pyrolysis GCMS, and they positively confirmed that what we sent them was tire related ingredients. So we have reason to suspect that there is a lot of tire particle in stormwater runoff. In terms of abundance, what we found was between one and 30 microparticles per liter in our 12 watersheds. This correlated really well with urban area. The more urban, the more microparticles in the runoff, and conversely, the less um, urban, the less, the fewer microparticles. The one um, land use that tracked really well was um, industrial area, the percent industrial area. So the more industrial area, the higher the microparticle concentration and vice versa. We have some hypotheses about why this is, um, <laughs> and, and some are a little contentious, um, but uh, we fortunately, the RMP is funding a two-year study to do a, um, a conceptual model development of microplastics in stormwater. So we're gonna do a deep dive into the literature and some analyses to, um, figure out where these are coming from, what areas we might uh, apply management actions, what those could be, and also to help us develop a more robust sampling program for the future. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a loads estimate, but I have to caveat it very heavily. Um, um, so first of all, again, we only did 12 sites and we did them during just one storm event. And we used a pretty simple model for scaling up from our 12 sites. So, so we're talking big error bars, right? But if you've read the newspaper, you know that what we estimate is about 11 trillion microparticles to the San Francisco Bay annually from stormwater, um, 7 trillion of those being actually plastic. Um, this compares to wastewater in which we estimate 17 billion microplastics um, to the Bay annually. So the stormwater load is more than 300 times greater than the um, than the wastewater load. So big air bars, um, is it's still a huge load relative to wastewater. Okay, and finally, I'm gonna end with green stormwater infrastructure. Still doing okay on time. Okay, so recently we got to do a study in El Cerrito on this uh, bioretention rain garden and for a little one-on-one -on, -one on uh, green infrastructure. In this picture, it's raining. Water's flowing off the landscape into our rain garden. From a cross-sectional view of that, um, water's coming in the inlet, and it's ponding on top and then infiltrating down through the soils. And then in the, ca in the case of this uh, rain garden, there was an underdrain. So water's flowing out the outlet and into the main storm drain system. So we got to measure pollutants at the inlet and the outlet to this rain garden. And what we found um, for most of our pollutants, if you see the on the left side of each of these graphs is the concentrations at the inlet, and on the right side of each graph, concentrations at the outlet. And then in most of these cases, there were significant declines or reductions due to the, the, the water passing through the rain garden. In the first ever um, study of microplastics um, in a green stormwater infrastructure system, uh, we found that over three storm events, um, microparticles were reduced by over 90%. So again, this is just one case study, but very, very promising results. Okay, to kind of finish up where we headed, we're gonna continue our reconnaissance monitoring. Um, we're going to start up that study on suspended sediment loads monitoring. We're going to continue our three-year study of CECs. We're developing the conceptual model for uh, microplastics in stormwater. We're, we're going to ramp up on modeling to support um, regional loads and trends analyses. And finally, we're hoping in the future to do some DMP effectiveness monitoring to support modeling. How am I doing on time? Good. So I'm, I'm going to end, though, with an ask and a gratitude. Um, 
I'm going to start with the gratitude. Um, first of all, thanks to the stormwater monitoring team. They are uh, spectacular to work with. And then on behalf of the stormwater monitoring team, I want to thank the RMP and all of you who support and collaborate with the RMP. Um, I think I speak for the team that it's not lost on us how uh, how wonderful our job is and, and how wonderful it is to get to go out and do what we do. So thank you. And my ask, people, we need rain. We, <laughs> we need rain. To, to really do what we want to do, to get as much data as possible, we need rain. So I'm asking each of you to go home and do your rain dance. All right? But I'm not going to leave you hanging. We, we have some examples of what those could look like. So this is me and my kin. The, the one in front is my son. And I'd say he's almost got it. Um, you could pretend to be rain. Or if you're Meg Sedlak, you could make rain happen and run around like a wild banshee. You can give the death glare and let someone dance behind you. <laughs> you can dance with your dog. Or you could do a dance that only nine-year-olds should do. <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, thanks to all the speakers, and um, now we'll have our um, panel discussion. Yep. Can I ask a question? <laughs> this is a, my carrier um, to to Reed and Tom. So. Is there any sticks or carrots or levers, whatever you want to call them, to get private land developers to to do more of this green infrastructure stuff? Like I saw like a an apartment complex go up recently and it had tree elevated off the surface, you know, so they need irrigation, plus they're not helping the stormwater issue any. And, you know, how do you get things like that implemented in private projects? Okay. Uh, yeah, I can respond. Um, we have uh, a few jurisdictions in San Mateo that are pursuing um, new requirements for new and redevelopment projects to include green infrastructure in the right of way where they wouldn't otherwise. Um, and so there, there are a couple now that are actually requiring that uh, for certain uh, size thresholds or um, uh, property types like commercial or large uh, mixed use residential and commercial buildings, um, but that's a yeah that's a great opportunity to leverage those resources. And I think where a, a property is already going to uh, build landscaping into the development, it makes sense to easily incorporate green infrastructure into into that site. One one thing to consider, I guess, is the um, operations and maintenance after that infrastructure is built. So. Um, there may be some reluctance on the developer's perspective to maintain a right-of-way um, facility, but it's not out of the question, and we've heard uh, success so far. There actually, I think in, in Redwood City, there may be somewhere around 10 to 12 projects that have been identified for, for that kind of thing, and um, simply having a, an o and agreement between the city and the property to maintain them over time has been successful so far. So, so what you saw, Don, shouldn't be happening in 2019. And it's the fact that it did must be because it was permitted before the mandate that's in our municipal regional permit that requires municipalities to require any new or redevelopment that creates a minimum of 10,000 square feet of new or replaced impervious surface. They must put in essentially green infrastructure. And that's actually low. There's a 5,000 or one eighth of an acre that applies to certain more trans transportation kind of sources like, like gas, places like uh, fast food restaurants or convenience stores, which have a lot of traffic flow. So the future should be all LID. I mean, it took us years to get the conventional parking lots to go from raised 
bed landscaping to now what you should be seeing more and more is integration runoff into the parking lot through some form of green infrastructure. So it's a mandate. And so that that's really what's happening. If it's not happening, then there's a compliance issue. Okay. Any other questions? I have a question. Is any you need to use the, you need to use the yeah, mic. Wait, please wait for the mic. Yeah, has any studies been done on, on microparticles in air versus the water, especially with regards to like car, car tires you mentioned? Uh, it would seem like a lot of it comes from dry fallout from tire wear. Right. And Because I know I, I live in, a, in the city on a busy street, and I moved there from Twin Peaks, which was not a busy street. On Twin Peaks, my dust was beige or very light gray. But now that I moved into the, of a busy street, my dust is black. And I have to keep the window shut on the street side. Otherwise, I've got all this black dust on the curtains and shutters, et cetera. So there must have been some study somewhere. So the, the source that you're finding in the water, obviously from the street wash off and dry fallout from the air in an urban area. And, and there must have been some study somewhere done on that. Right. Pro I'm guessing so, but I can't speak to that authoritatively. Is there anyone in the audience that can? Kelly can. John. <laughs> yeah, there, there's actually been quite a bit of work on understanding the wear debris from tires, its particle size, its distribution, its transport away from freeways. And part of what the next project in the um, RMP is funding that's conceptual model is going to be taking a look at is, that, among other things, is it diving into the literature in that piece and resolving it. Um, a, a lot of people look at different particle sizes. So the dust that gets in your home depends partly on how far away you are from the, the source that generates it. The, the biggest particles fall out within a few tens of meters of the road, um, whether or not your windows open, that kind of thing. Smaller particles can transport a lot farther, but they're a small part of the size distribution. But they're studied by different people who then study the big ones. And we're interested in some of these larger ones because of the way they move around in urban runoff. So it's it's complex, and it's something that I'm actually really thrilled that the RMP is funding to follow up to really understand how that relates to water. But the phenomena that you talk about, about the dark dust versus the light dust, that's really well known, and it's really well known that it's related to tires, and that that is actually really well studied by scientists other than us who are not in the water quality arena. But to add on to what you just what Kelly just said, it's it's complicated because there's there's particles in the air in this room, and there's a uh, and it's it, how do these contaminants of concern get in runoff? And that's in the first place because people aren't purposely breaking things up and putting them in there. It's somehow it's, air is a means for things getting redistributed in, in our urban environment. And the more dense the population, you know, the more the higher density population, high density cars, we, we're obviously going to see more crap in the air. And fortunately, California has some pretty strong air rules. Human health driven. So we on the, on the, on the environment, you know, the eco side kind of ride the coattails of that, but there has been a lot more attention in recent years and small particles in the air, which hope, you know, which obviously is beneficial to us. So it needs much more attention. There is you know, some understanding, but not enough to, to make the case of how to intervene. Any other questions? I, I had a question regarding, uh, you know, the demolition you talked about, the house demolition. Uh, is it, uh, this is just, um, uh, this is not something I know about, but is it not possible to uh, uh, put a, enclose it, like cover it with uh, some kind of uh, material and then do the um, uh, demolition so that the particles don't become airborne? Mm -hmm. Because if you're doing a, a whole area, it doesn't really matter. You just need to hit the thing. Oh, sorry. You just need to hit the thing. So if you cover it with uh, material, then it will ensure that a particles are not gone airborne and spread around. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. This program is, is totally new, so it's the first shot at controlling PCBs and demolition projects. There are others like the asbestos and uh, lead-based paint programs. Our program was not uh, focused on control measures for um, demolition um, uh, prevention of, of dust and uh, debris during demolition, but focusing on identifying potential sources of those pollutants, okay. um, and then 
if they are found at a certain level within these materials, then uh, then those projects would be referred to the Water Board or DTSC, the proper agencies to um, do abatement and make sure that controls are in place. So yeah, I don't know the details on um, protection oh. during demolition, but yeah, the, there are practices in place for that. I, I can elaborate a little bit because think about uh, asbestos and how what goes on for dealing with asbestos in buildings. There's a bit of that type of best practice to consolidate. So, but to do this at the scale of building demolition, and the, we're, we're talking about a lot of institute, large institutional buildings that were built in the 50, you know, the 40s, 50s, which tend to use a lot of PCBs because they were magic materials. They're strong and flexible and long lived. So there's a lot in cock around windows and doors. So it's not, if you demolish it and you get those, you're still going to end up with that material. And where is it going to go? How, we did a back of the envelope calculation of how much PCBs may be in these buildings, and I don't have it on top of my head, but it's it's thousands of tons. And compared to like the 90 kilograms per year going into the bay, there's an incredible reservoir. The, the goal is to is is to use federal authority, which needs to which doesn't jive with California authority in terms of PCB levels that are considered hazardous waste, and these materials have to but have to be disposed of in hazardous waste facilities which is like putting them on, on trucks, which is not a good idea, versus the status quo is they're all treated like construction debris waste and, and mostly recycled. And so the exposure is just transferred all over the place. In between is contain the parts of the buildings where no PCBs are known to be there, like around the windows. And so if it's, if it's taken apart in bulk, federal law says that can go to a municipal landfill. Mm -hmm. uh, state law currently wouldn't allow that. And that's that's something that will get some attention as an outgrowth of this effort because some numerous parties are now quite concerned about what's it going to cost them to comply with this great idea. And one one quick question. The other uh, question was, uh, um, you know, rubber oh, rubber thing, rubber uh, waste on the so. Is it rubber coming from the tires, or is it in the construction of the road they use uh, rubber um, and they do carbon black even in fields? And is it that that? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I'm not sure that we can say yet. Um, I, and again, does does anyone know more than me that yeah. Kel Kelly knows everything? <laughs> 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 I'm Kelly Moran. I'm a science advisor to the RMP, and I also I did a literature review a few years ago that um, covered tires and tire emissions. I was looking at zinc sources at that point. Uh, most asphalt is not rubberized, and so it's not a source of rubber from tires. Um, there is a trend to incorporate tire scraps actually into uh, asphalt for a variety of reasons. So that's a question that's outstanding among many around the reuse of the tires. There are different particle sizes coming off the road than coming off the tires, so different fate and transport properties. So it's a little bit of a complicated story. And I think the data are pretty clear that most of the rubber you would see in runoff is from tires. Well, on that note, I have a question. So uh, it seems like driving less would be a good thing for a good multi-benefit thing because we would have less tire plastic particles as well as tire compounds, and it would be better for resilience. So how can the water board work um, on both climate change and stormwater? <laughs> <laughs> how can the water board get all you to to get our legislators and our decision makers to think in those terms and quit. What is it? We are already part of the, the story, the dialogue that's changing most urban areas from habitat for automobiles to the, to the greenings. But look how much of our communities are designed for automobile habitat and, and historically all directly con connected a uh, hard surface, so not only are the pollutants associated with the automobiles, but just anything in the atmosphere that comes down is flushes into our system. So we have a movement afoot, but think what's good, something like if the, if the tire, tire particle issue grows, it will, uh, I shouldn't say if, as it grows, it's going to, it's going to be a head turner. And are, are we going to be able to intercept and treat prior particles from runoff? No. Or we, if we are, we're going to be spending gazillion billion dollars. And is that the best use of a gazillion billion dollars? Or should we build more efficient 
user-friendly transportation systems and get people out of the car. That's what we're, that's future. But that's bigger than what just the water board can, can mandate, <laughs> but we can, we can facilitate by, you know, you know we will, you know, our board is not shy about uh, encouraging and certainly rewarding the, a path in that direction. To his credit, at the Microplastic Symposium in this room last week, Jared Blumenfeld spoke to this issue, and he, he he didn't talk about treating road runoff. He talked about getting people out of cars is the solution to that problem. So then, if it's coming at Cal EPA, well, then we have multiple paths, multiple state authorities that could be integrated to doing this, and we do it in partnership with the municipalities. But most importantly, the public has to embrace it. So let's go out and. Start driving less. Do you want to add, Reed, anything? Uh, no, no, I agree. I've heard the same thing. I was talking to Tom about this at Casco, and uh, definitely agree. I mean, the um, bioretention is, is built to handle uh, the special soils that go into a, a, a rain garden or curb extension are, are built to handle PCBs and mercury. They may be effective at some other pollutants, but uh, certainly not designed to handle anything and all that's coming off the environment. Any so, other questions? I, I guess I have the mic. Um, so, I mean, maybe a point, and maybe you guys can respond to this, but um, there's thousands of acres now that have been treated by green stormwater infrastructure throughout the region as a result of what Tom was talking about. And so that started back in 2005, and so for now 15 years, basically, new and redevelopment has had to put in green stormwater infrastructure to treat their impervious surfaces. So that's a big win, but that's parcel based. So that's when a you as a developer want to create a new uh, multifamily home or a condo complex or a commercial construction, and it treats the runoff from the roofs and the parking lots associated with that parcel. The streets are the public agencies' responsibilities, and in, in some cases, the Caltrans side of things. And so PCBs and maybe mercury even associated with those parcels are really being addressed through those parcel-based types of approaches. When we start talking about tire wear debris, which is generated on the streets themselves, we're now talking about a public investment, not a private investment. And so the funding sources associated with retrofitting our streets and competing those with bike lanes now um, and other um, needs associated with automobiles is now kind of hitting the forefront. And so I guess this is a plea more than anything is that one, um, we can't just put this on always on the developers themselves or the property owners themselves. It is gonna be a turn if we wanna see our streets retrofitted um, either when they are dug up and, and recreated um, or bike lanes or pedestrian friendly um, situations come in. Um, the, the, the need for funding to support those types of efforts right now is just not there. Um, and so having all of you in the room motivated to talk to your legislators, to talk to folks that are in charge of their, the transportation funds that, um, as Bill pointed out or someone else pointed out earlier, there's a big investment, um, towards transportation. Um, Having portions of that actually deal with water quality, not just bikes and not just uh, um, automobiles themselves, um, is an important aspect. So I think we, we all have to have a kind of more comprehensive view, as you said, um, of this and looking at water quality as a benefit associated with those roadways as well. So, Chris, I like to play with numbers, and I get, just did a calculation in my head, and I think if we had 5 million, five million cars, at least in the Bay Area, they cost approximately $20,000 dollars a piece. Do the math, that's $200 billion worth of uh, investment that the public takes for granted. And, uh, and at the, how sustainable is that uh, as, as the cost of doing business in a lot of ways? So this puts it that kind of, we, we spend a lot of money on certain type for certain reasons. And uh, it's almost like it's sacrilegious that we can't change that because that's, we all have to have our cars, but turn that around. And what if we invested a reasonable fraction of that in better infrastructure. So we would actually have mass transit that, like I like to say, would be user-friendly, convenient, we would use it. We gotta think big and different. Any other questions? Couple over here. Yeah, I have the mic here. 
Um, since so much is already being asked of water board earlier, um, homeless issue was mentioned. Of course, much bigger societal issue than just water quality. But in the Bay Area, is there any programs to address that from water quality perspective? Uh, yeah, my board. Well, we're it, it's part of uh, the municipal regional permit. It's, there's not a direct mandate, but it's uh, it's recognized that that's part of the trash pathway. So the the dialogue is started. Uh, clearly, it has to be done not community by community, but um, more regionally. It's a huge challenge. Again, back to a lot of people live in the Bay Area because of, it's a special. We have to do this as a, you have to do that regionally. It's why it's great to hear like the Bay Area Council, which is a represent Bay Area business, because we have to take on, we have to manage the homeless problem. We have to do it regionally. We will do our part. Our, you know, Jim, did you want to, you looked like you wanted to say something. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting question. There's somewhere between 30 and 50,000 homeless people. And, in the Bay Area, and they're a, they're a, a generator of, of human waste um, that we haven't looked at well enough. So uh, I'm the ghost of RMP future. <laughs> we have to figure out how that fits into the priority system and what the responsibility is, and we will be dealing with that during the next uh, MS4 permitting process. Um, the advantage, and I'll go back to the to the universe. I mean, this is probably my 25th RFP meeting. The advantage of the system is we do try to bring science into our process of setting priorities, and that's the great thing about this. Um, so the answers are not immediately obvious, but science will help us get there. Okay, one more question. Um, what follow-up is planned uh, to that single study of a rain garden in El Cerrito? There are, of course, different media. There's flow-through versus rain garden. There's the question of what you do when the media gets saturated and what will last longer. I'm not criticizing you for not having done it yet, but what is going to happen next in those terms? Yeah, you've just mentioned every single step. Well, some of the studies that I hope that we are going to do soon. Um, uh, we don't currently, SFEI or the RMP doesn't have anything on the books at the moment. Um, Chris, with BASMA, do you guys have any studies coming online? Or? Well, I'm other back right there. One thing in play, the short answer is not much is happening yet, but this is getting every, there's a lot of attention being generated now. There is a legislative mandate for the Ocean Protection Council to develop a strategy, which in, in the presumption it would be that within that strategy would be the building off of this, identifying the needs to do this, but generate a fund, it has to come with funding. So, I mean, it's just not going to magically happen. We can't, the municipalities, are, can't volunteer to spend lots of money that they don't have. So we do need to have a large scale driver. But yeah, I know, I know you're, when you talk about these strategies, they don't necessarily, you know, they take a long time to develop. They take a long time to actually be implemented. So Susan, I, I, I would say, you know, kind of look beyond the RMP and the RMP itself may not be addressing this issue as a highest priority. The stormwater community itself, just coming back from the California Stormwater Quality Association for the last um, um, conference, for the last many of us were there for the last three days. There's a huge effort right now on trying to monitor bioretention facilities, rain gardens, not only throughout the state, but nationwide, enter that data, high quality data into an international stormwater BMP database to try to really understand statistically whether we're seeing reductions associated with different types of contaminants microplastics right now not on anybody's radar um, because it's just such a new thing we've all gravitated and you know, dealing with the trash world for the last 15 years myself and um, being immersed in that the microplastic we've been working on macroplastics for a long time now the microplastic element is a whole nother element now that we're going to have to address and we don't um, necessarily even fully know the operation and maintenance aspects of all these systems and so that's a whole other element just from a, a practical standpoint. How do you maintain these systems? How often do they need to be replaced, the media itself? 
Uh, it depends on where you are. So there's a, another effort that I know Keith Lakes from the Water Board is also very involved on a, on a national level of trying to come up with those operation and maintenance standards as well. So there's a lot of fronts that are happening. It may not be happening directly in RMP, but it is happening slowly. Not enough, probably. Um, there probably needs to be more push and more funding towards that as well. All right, we're out of time, so let's thank our amazing speakers. And so now we have lunch. There is seating for lunches available out in the main lobby, in the Kinsey room, and upstairs in the Tamal Pais room, and adjoining terrace. And please return at 1.05 for the next session.